What's up, everyone? We are live at five. It's Tuesday. I had to look. June 16th. Ooh. I'm Paul Wontorek. And I'm Michael James Scott. Mm -hmm. It must be Tuesday. <laughs> Michael James Scott is here. Uh, yeah, you're back. It's Tuesday. You're back. I'm back. back. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. Yes, we had a I had to come back. It was time. We had a fantastic roundtable last week, and we've gathered an amazing group of uh, a, a second, you know, not this is not, they're not in second place. This is like, it's building. This is building. We're creating conversations. Yes, Very excited to have you here. We're joined, as always, by Caitlin Moynihan. Hello. Hi, Caitlin. I'm so glad Michael's hey, back. Caitlin. I know you yes. are. Hey, girl. Tuesdays. <laughs> okay, so we're going to find out who's here on the panel. Actually, no, let's tell them now. Who's here? Let's get it done. <gasps> Yes! Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> Y'all, today it is Brandon Victor Dixon. It is Montego Glover. It is Nikki M. James. And they Michael James Scott. In on the... Oh, that's right, and me, Michael James Scott. <laughs> hey. <laughs> we'll get to our fantastic stars, but first, let's do a little news. If you miss David Byrne's American Utopia, you're still going to be able to see it this year. I mean, I don't think this show is going anywhere because it was a big hit on Broadway and then Spike Lee filmed it and made uh, a Spike Lee joint out of it. And so that's what we're talking about now. So we didn't really know when we were going to get to see it, but now HBO announced that they will be airing it. They didn't announce a date though, so it's not really solid news. Um, but of course it played at uh, the Hudson Theater last fall. It was supposed to come back this fall, I don't know if you could bank on that. Uh, it's also going to be a book, and uh, it's going to be, you know, did you get to see it, Michael? Did you see that show? You were I didn't get to see it, but I, yes, I didn't get to see it, but it, I mean, you know, not Spike Lee filming, come on now. Like, it, yeah. I don't think it's going anywhere. Right. <laughs> It'll be the best seats in the house. This is the way to watch it, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, and yes. we found out today that the West Coast premiere of this show is going to be delayed even longer. So, yes, you guys, so the West Coast premiere of the Lehman Trilogy um, and more was delayed at a center group theater postpones reopening the Amundsen. I mean, it's another result to all the craziness with the coronavirus um, crisis, but it was previously scheduled for the West Coast premiere of the Lehman Trilogy, uh, which also prevented actually happening on broad officially on broadway as well right. on march 26th has also been postponed which you know all of it which was actually across the street from aladdin so i remember it, it like it come up it was going to be at the Nederlander theater i was like oh my gosh it's coming um but the Amundsen theater will not be reopening until the spring of 2021 as of now uh the lehman trilogy was set to run from october 20th through november 28th We'll have to wait a little bit. Hopefully, it's it'll. fantastic. Yes, yes. it's and so good. It's very good, and these big names are coming together for this beautiful tribute album. So that's Adam Schlesinger, uh, the super talent, who, of course, we lost to COVID nineteen, one of the horrible losses for the theater community. Um, a bunch of his friends are coming together to make an album called "Saving for a Custom Van." It's a tribute album to honor his life and work. It's coming out June of today, June sixteenth, on Bandcamp. That's the new thing. I don't know if you knew that Bandcamp. Oh. Uh, and it, uh, he died April 1st, um, and it featured performances by Rachel Bloom because, of course, he won an Emmy Award for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, uh, Sarah Silverman, and more. And all of the uh, proceeds will be donated to the Music Cares COVID-19 Relief Fund. Um, he was represented on Broadway by the musical Cry Baby and an Act of God, a super talented guy, and this is a fitting tribute to his talents. And we found out today when people are going to be able to see a reading of this award-winning new work. What book is that? Yes, yeah, so the heroes of the fourth turning. Yeah, <laughs> so the hero of the fourth turning reading rescheduled for is now rescheduled for July eighteenth. Um, the Pulitzer Prize finalist, Heroes of the Fourth Turning, will be presented on Play Purview on July eighteenth. Play Purview um, mm -hmm. uh, at eight p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Theus Taymor returns to direct. The original Playwrights Horizon cast will all reprise their 
performances for the reading. The play is set around midnight in Wyoming where four young conservatives have gathered at a backyard party, but as their reunion spirals into spiritual chaos and clashing generational politics, it becomes less a celebration than a victorious fight to be understood, okay? It also uh, was one of the finalists for the Pulitzer Prize for Drama and earned two Outer Critic Circle Award honors, three Lu Lucy Lortel Awards and the New York Drama Critic Circle Award for Best Play. Yes, well, at least it's gonna be rescheduled, good Lord. Definitely. And speaking of albums, these stars are coming together for this awesome new music event. Well, these stars, these stars is Dan Chris. That's, of course, Dan Chris, a friend of Broadway.com. So we were, I was just talking about Music Cares, and I have another story about Music Cares. There's going to be an event called Soundtrack of Our Lives, a celebration of the, for, uh, for the film and TV music community. This is happening June 25th at 3 p.m., raising money for Music Cares. Um, which is basically to help people in the music industry uh, affected by the coronavirus. This will be on YouTube. Darren Chris, Kai Lapone, Elizabeth Moss, Anika Noni Rose, John Stamos, Peter Gallagher, uh, Zach Levi, Rue McIntyre. There's too many people. Alex Newell, Harvey Firestein. Yes. This is a lot of people. Sting, Catherine O'Hara, Weird Al Yankovic. This is a lot. Uh, and also, adorably, <laughs> um, uh, Alan Menken will be singing A Whole New World, which is in a show called Aladdin. But this guy, I was trying to aim Aww. my, this guy, and he's singing it with his daughter, uh, Anna Rose. So that's that's super cute. Oh just my to, gosh. Just to crank up the cute factor. Have you ever sang that song? I love that. Um, I don't get to sing it in the show, but I do pretend that I am on the carpet when I am during the show because sure. <laughs> how can you not? <laughs> why wouldn't you? You know, now that you're here, why don't you just reveal how they do that magic carpet? Let's just reveal all the secrets of this. Are you kidding me, Paul? Are you kidding me right now? How dare that, you? You're you trying to take my job. We tried to just slip it in. That is my cue to get out of here. Uh, I'm out. <laughs> you're in charge here, Michael. Uh, have a good time with today's mm -hmm. panel. Thank you, Boos. Thank you, Boo. All right, y'all. Okay, I am so happy to be back um, with another uh, episode here on Live at Five, where I will be moderating a roundtable discussion on race and more with my fellow Broadway Black Theater. Amazing, amazing, amazing people. Today I have... Miss Nikki M. James, I have Mr. Brandon Victor Dixon, and I have, oh yes, just a casual, yes, yes, there he is. And then also the lovely Miss Montego Glover joining me, yes, there they are. <laughs> All right, y'all, so let me tell you a little bit. Oh, oh, yes! <laughs> there they are. What's the little one, y'all? Hi, there you go. Okay, now let me just brag on you all a little bit first before we get going into this, just so that, you know, we just, I just need to lay down the foundation of what's going on right now. So let me start with uh, my lovely, lovely Miss Nikki M. James. Miss Nikki M. James received a Tony Award in 2011 for her featured turn as Nabalungi in the Book of Mormon. Oh yes, we yes. got to do that together. There she is. Um, her other Broadway credits include Les Mis, All Shook Up, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. I mean, James also was the assistant director to the Tony winning revival of Once on This Island in 2018, which is everything. Uh, FYI, well, the fun fact, I made my Broadway debut with well, in the same sh in the show that Miss Nikki M. James starred in, and it's called All Shook Up. So I'm very happy that she is here. That's Miss Nikki M. James. Awesome. We also we're going on to the lovely Miss Montego Glover. Miss Montego Glover earned a Tony nomination for starring in Memphis. Okay, um, there she is, as her, and has previously been seen in Les Mis, The Color Purple, and It Should Have Been You. She played Angelica Skyler. Angelica. Um, <laughs> in the Chicago production of Hamilton and recently starred in this season's All the Natalie Portman's Off-Broadway, which earned her recognition at this year's Outer Critics Circle Awards. Yes, that is Miss Montego Glover. Come on now. <laughs> Last but certainly, certainly not least is the Mr. Brandon Victor Dixon, y'all. <laughs> so Brandon was most recently seen on Broadway in his Tony-nominated turn as UB Blake and Shuffle Along or the Making of the Musical Sensation of 1921. 
and all that followed. He also earned, there they are. Come on, look at that chocolate, all that gorgeous chocolate on that stage. I love it. He also earned a nomination for appearing in the original Broadway production of The Color Purple, like the color purple. Dixon's other Broadway credits include starring, starring turn as Aaron Burr in Hamilton and being part of the Tony Winnie production team for the Hedwig for Hedwig and Angry Inch. Come on. He also earned <clears throat> an Emmy nomination for his portrayal as Judas in NBC's live concert version of Jesus Body Christ down. Superstar. There it is. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I am so happy that you all are here. There's so much, there's so much fierce talent all on the screen right now that I'm sure fans and the audience are all just freaking out. Um, it's so wonderful. Thank you all for being here. Um, I want to, I want to get all into it. I want to just get into it. Um, so last week we talked about the awakening that has been happening uh, in, in our country and also in our community, in our Broadway community. And this week, I wanted to discuss the navigating um, because this is really important uh, as we've been, it's been, you know, we've been crack, cracking open racial issues in, in obviously in this country for years and many, 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 many years, but more specifically the racial issues in like I said, our Broadway community. Um, it's, it is actually important to me uh, to be able to talk to, to you all who have been in this business for a minute, <laughs> for quite some time, and what that has been for you all. Um, but I first want to ask you how you're navigating this monumental moment right now for yourselves. Nikki? Uh, so... It's, I mean, I think the biggest question is right now for me is um, I've never not been having these kind of tough conversations with my friends, my families, my coworkers. Um, I'm, I'm pretty vocal I'm, uh, about my feelings, about <laughs> race relations, about microaggressions. I, I, and I'm not so shy about calling people out, quote unquote, calling people out. What I'm nervous about for me personally is how much of my thoughts and feelings I want to put out into the universe in the social media landscape. I, I recognize that I have a platform. I recognize that I have followers. And I recognize that, there, that I have the ability to help educate and share. But I get nervous about sending things out in, in a way that's not a dialogue. And I've been watching so many of my brave um, friends um, both in this community and outside of this community, really using their platform, Brandon, um, in such like a beautiful public way. And I will say that I felt anxious about um, about not about putting something out without having it be able to be a dialogue and a discussion. So that's like that's like mm -hmm. the thing that's just me personally within this business and this industry. The navigating right now feels like. There's a point in your lives when you're when we're all working, where we're trying to get the next job. You know, we're trying to work with the next director we want to work with. We want to do that next project. And almost every question is, how much does this project um, serve my my artistic soul, my bank account a little bit, um, and my career ambitions? And then there's this added layer that has become really clear, which is, how, what is this job saying? in a broader scale. What is the message that's being sent out? And um, and I think since we're all on this pause, it's, it's really interesting to think when we come out of the coronavirus, uh, uh, you know, pandemic, um, and I know that <laughs> well, and when theater comes back, um, what is gonna be the most important thing at the top of my list as I choose the projects that I work on next, as I choose my, the collaborators that I work with next? And so that's part of the navigation is, is um is being aware of what what I'm saying, how I'm saying it, and um and and being a part of a conversation, which is why I was so excited um to join you today, Michael, because I love you and I love Brandon Montego, and I know that this will be a beautiful back and forth where I'll be able to share ideas, hear ideas, and I may come out of this conversation feeling differently than I did in the beginning, and that I think is an important growth element for for everyone involved in in this where we are in this climate. Um, 
So that's what that's I'm, the, the, one of the things I'm thinking about as far as navigation is concerned. It's what's uh, not what's past, but what's absolutely. Past. Yes, that's one. I mean, that's that that's beautiful. And also, thank you for being vulnerable enough to say, you know, just feeling, you know, just just feeling, uh, just sort of how to, to to sort of do that and sort of taking that breath back because you're just trying to really figure that out. So, I mean, you yeah. know, I'm with you with that. It's 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 really it's really important. Brandon, what about for you um, in this moment and in terms of, you know, you are you are pretty vocal. I mean, you you are. A, and have always been a leader for for many people, not just being the lead in a show. So I am curious for you in this moment, this navigation for you right now, how that is for you. Uh, for myself, you know, it 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 it's it it's. I, I've actually been thinking about that, how I'm navigating things and, and trying to gauge my response. And I'll I'll be honest with you, I haven't been. Um, to I haven't been caught in the uh, in the emotional wave of expression that has been building in this moment, and and at times I was trying to figure out what that was saying about me or what that meant. And well, look, one thing is, you know, I I, uh, I have not watched some of the latest videos just because I know what they contain. <clears throat> I so I know mm -hmm. what story telling, and and that helped me to reflect on the fact that I already know what's going on. So one of the things I kind of had to reflect on is that the things that I have been working on in different spaces are, are built to address these issues, these systemic issues. And so part of it for me was, was reminding myself to just continue to focus on doing the work, uh, the building blocks that I have been doing in certain spaces. And, but also now thinking about, like you talked about this awakening, right? Thinking about yes. to create further extensions from the things I'm, I've been building in smaller pockets how to create greater extensions to uh, to these to these areas of my community who are who are whose consciousness is now expanding to this arena of we have to operate differently than we did before. What can we do now? And so you know about talk. So so for me, it's about communicating, uh, connecting with the community now to talk about how to create those spaces and those vehicles for. Our, our, our newly, uh, our, our, our advancing brothers and sisters. Where are these spaces that mm. we can now start to ingest the information we need to make the plan to move forward into our next phase? You know, it doesn't transform today. Yeah. We make yep. the decision. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that makes, yes, that's exactly right. I mean, we are, we are truly <laughs> like it is. It is a it is a marathon, not a sprint, and and we are all trying to really figure that. I see you shaking your head, Miss Montego Glover, <laughs> in this moment, and and yes, just like a, you're giving like a church rock, like just like a sensible. <laughs> all right, now that we know we're here, let's flick the switch and it's like it's going. Right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Miss Montego, what has that with your church rock? What are you church rocking about? Because what is that navigation for you? <laughs> First and foremost, I just I love that I'm sitting in the presence of the three of you because honestly, there's something about um, knowing that you're not the only person feeling a certain way or thinking a certain thing. And with all of the emotional response, Brandon, that is just the right phrase for it, because there is an emotional response. So you can't decide that there isn't, but also a level of anxiousness. Nikki, you yeah. have it right on the head, just um, be because we are all have been awakened to an, an uncomfortable place that for some of us may have been there all along in hotter frequencies and higher frequencies, but now. We're, we're having to embrace it all together at the same time. Everybody's being brought to the same level, at least the same level of understanding or at least exposure. And I think what I've been toying with and, and moving around with inside my spirit and my soul is um, how to say it. In terms of navigating, it's about um, really listening. I have found that when you have an emotional response to something or when there's been such a huge seismic shift, the, the, the hardest thing to do is to really get still 
and really start listening and really start picking up on the cues, really start hearing what other people are trying to communicate. And, and even if what they're trying to communicate is, I don't understand or I never knew this and really giving an opportunity to do that because what we've been wanting and trying for and working on for so long is exactly that. It's one of the reasons I, I truly treasure, aside from the fact that I love it so much, I truly treasure being an actress because I get to tell those stories in a way that is accessible and that is relatable to just about everybody. The human experience is the human experience. And now we're gonna, we've awakened about the black experience and now we're gonna spend some time on it because I think it's really important. So for me, it's been about listening and getting still before you start running to be sure you know exactly where you wanna run as you um, hold up this cause, as you hold up this movement and deciding in that quietness, what kind of mover you are what yeah. kind of activist you are. And it does not have to be the same for everybody. What's most important is that you f you're fully connected to what it is you feel, to what it is you know you have had inside the experience and you can effectively communicate that. And in my opinion, at least for me, I can't do it until I've gotten quiet and I have gotten still and I've really gotten clear about what my values are. Mm. Then yes. I'm it feels a bit like, um this is gonna sound like a silly analogy, but, but it's like dieting, right? Where like, you absolutely know what you should be putting into your body. You absolutely know the things that will nourish us. And we know that they do taste delicious. But when you have been filling your mouth with sweets and candy, your taste buds, they're too, they've been heightened so much that they yeah. can't taste the subtleties of the beautiful complexity of the food yeah. that we actually will fill our soul. And it's very yeah. easy to go for a processed food for a quick fix, mm -hmm. satisfying in the moment. And then two hours later, you think, I'm hungry. And I feel like this thing that's kind of happening, what I hope is happening, is that we're all looking at our, our diets, our spiritual <laughs> diets, our conversations, and we're saying, what feels good right now versus what is going to get me to where I need to be going? You know, what is mm. going to get me to that three hour show? If I have some pasta <laughs> half at intermission, I'm going to be out on my ass, right? And <laughs> clean vegetables. I think there's this element, but even when you know what you're supposed to do, it requires diligence every day until your habit becomes to reach for the good for you thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think yes. we're, we're deeply disciplined. When we have a show that we need to get through, and I say like, in order to get through the Book of Mormon eight times a week, I cannot drink, I cannot eat bread, I cannot have milk, I have to sleep eight hours. I can do it because the payoff to me is worth the, the quote unquote sacrifice. That's and a fear of pain. You're making this so wholesome. That's a fear of pain. <laughs> <laughs> it's fear of pain. <laughs> it's, like, collectively we have to decide that like the payoff is worth the being uncomfortable right now yeah absolutely in our well the uncomfortableness is good <laughs> for, <laughs> for a little bit right you know what i mean like i love that we all gave a collective congregation lean in at a, at a moment like literally there was a full lean in moment that just happened i'm living for that oh my gosh well i'm like Great, we're done. Thank you. I mean, basically. Like, <laughs> I, so, I, for 30 minutes. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> so I'm, I, I love this because, you know, I, I do think um, it, one of the reasons why being able to do this on Broadway.com is that this is the truly the first time where fans and our audience are, uh, are uh, the fans and audiences of Broadway.com are actually getting to hear a different aside from our actors of color and our people in the industry of, act, uh, of color and their, their experience on, on, on this business for them navigating through their, their, their careers as folks of color. So it's really wonderful that we can, and you all are being, you're so open about that right now. And it's in a way that I believe uh, people are, as Montego said, important to listen. So that is, that, that, that is, that is something that I wanted to make sure that we are getting to do an experience right now with a, a platform like Broadway.com. So, you know, all of you have been so successful and, you know, we all, 
we all dream of being having a career and being successful and doing the things. And you all have been able to, you know, ha- figure that out in, in, a, in a way and in, in just sort of the grind of it all. And what I, I, what I think I'd love to sort of dive into is becoming successful and the navigation that has taken place for you each um, uh, being of color and sustaining success um, and what that must be like. <laughs> so <laughs> Nikki, uh, Nikki, obviously we talked about you taking home uh, a Tony award in 2011. I'm uh we were all screaming our faces off when that happened. Um, and I've known you for many, many years. And of course it was a thing. And P.S. Nikki was the only acting award of that show that was that won. So just saying, <laughs> um, you know, but I, I, I want to, what I want to, what I want to ask you about is to tell me about a, obviously, of course, being the only female lead in the show who also happened to be of color, but navigating the journey of that character and what you learned from that experience. Um, what I mean, it's a big question, but but there has been some uh, interesting things lately of, of, of specifically our show, The Book of Mormon. And so I think it's important um, to hear from the Tony winner, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> about that and specifically just that navigation that you've done within your career through that. So, I mean, I, first of all, I want to say the very first time I played a lead, a lead uh, in New York theater, my co-star was none other than Brandon Victor Dixon. We did. <laughs> We did a uh, house of flowers. Some college kids, <laughs> and we were babies. We were children, and I think Brandon was just about to go off to do um, the Lion King on the road. We were. I wasn't even out of college yet. You were when, you, when I was at Columbia at the time. We were like at, in class at the time. We were children, literally children. <laughs> and, um, and I have to say, like that cast. It was short lived, but it was Armelia McQueen and and uh, Maurice Hines and and Tanya Pinkins and Stacey Roscoe Lee Brown. And Roscoe Lee Brown. It was generations of Desmond powerful. Richardson. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was and like and and Desmond Richardson dancing the solo that was just like beyond beyond. I was like. I had I had an awakening as a human when I saw him. I just thought that there's something cosmic gift that this man hey, has been given. I have an unblemished record of heterosexuality, and that, that that's just one of the most beautiful. I was like, I don't know what's happening. Right now. <laughs> yeah. I love an unblemished record of the. <laughs> oh, I can't claim to be a part of this, this this group I love so much, and yet, but I. <laughs> but like, it wasn't lost on me that. You know, and this is not to take anything away from that incredible uh, process and my intro into New York theater and like one of the most beautiful scores ever written um, by Harold Arlen. But our entire creative team were, were, were not people of color. And, um, and that was like an interesting thing. It was one of my first times being in a cast of all uh, black people. But then the dynamic, right? There was, there was a divide. And, um, and I think uh, as I grew in this, in my career, I, I learned that there was a lot of times that I was gonna be one of the first, like the first time we were considering an actress of color for a role in this type of thing. Like I, I, I had this sense, Audra came before, you know, sort of doing non-traditional casting. I had a sense that that was a way in um, and, um, and but when I was invited to do the Book of Mormon, I had been up in Canada doing uh, classical theater. I played Juliet in Romeo and Juliet, and I played uh, Cleopatra in Shaw, Caesar, and Cleopatra, both roles that were not written for uh, Black performers. You know, we were doing a cast, there was a casting choice to cast me. And then um, I got a call to do the Book of Mormon. and. Uh, originally, the way they they sold it to me, because the the invite was, we can't send you the script, we can't tell you the name of it. These are the people involved, and you'll probably have to sign an NDA because they're not sure what the piece is going to be. And obviously, we all know now it's very sensitive material, and comedy satire, especially, has to really be 
calibrated exactly right to under to so, so that it so that the message is actually coming through. So I respected their choice to keep the process very insular and secretive, but they sold Navalungi as you know an African Disney princess. And <laughs> the idea that like it's a coming of age story for this young girl and. And I mean, even Salt Lake City has a little bit of part of your world, like sort of just like thrown in there. <laughs> I mean, literally, they were saying like, so for me, I was like, I grew up watching Disney. I really saw Nabalungi as a sweet, naive uh, young girl who was going through like a transformation, a growth process. And I come into the show and, you know, there was so much material that could be tricky. And uh, F you God, that's a big thing for for anybody who's religious and most of our cast of, of black performers were church going people. I mean, we've been going to church this whole time. So that was difficult. The idea that the Africans were being portrayed as maybe, uh, some people say stupid. I don't, I don't agree with that, but it was difficult. And, um, and then to be the only woman, so there's two elements, you know, I'm a woman of color, I'm the only woman, and I'm in this in this company, in this thing that's even bigger than myself. And once we got on that ride, we knew we were gonna make a splash. There was just no doubt. You remember, Michael, there was no doubt. No and doubt. I, I had a lot of conversations and thoughts with our creators about what the messaging is. And, um, and they were so open to hearing um, our thoughts, our ad additions, you know, some thing, little things about Nabalungi were my ideas. The texting device, I said, maybe she's writing down the book. Maybe she's the author. She's the first apostle of this new religion, you know? And then Meg came back with something much funnier than a notebook, obviously. But I, <laughs> I just felt like it was such a collaborative process. And I, I, the whole time I felt, I felt taken care of. What, what people feel when they watch it, there is hints of racism. It's about stereotypes. Like it is about the, the damage that stereotypes can do. It's about the damage that like truth from my perspective, it's really about the damage that like an unsuspecting, you know, sort of liberal white ally can come into a community and completely misunderstand what's happening. And in an effort to help, they end up sort of stripping people of their identity of their culture. And what I loved about this, our musical was that it was about how they took what they needed in order to lift their own community. And in fact, in the end, they sort of, they sort of brush aside the Mormonism and say, you know what, this is what works for us. It was tricky. And um, it continues yeah. to be tricky. And as you can hear, my thoughts and my feelings about it evolve. I will also say that when we opened the show, we lived in a different world than we live in right now. Yes. In 2011, we started workshopping that show in 2008. 2008 was Yes We Can. 2008 was Hope. 2012 was Gay Marriage. We were in a different world. Mm -hmm. And 2016, 2018, 2020, the hope that we felt then is not as present. And when you revisit a show, like a satirical show, it has a different color now. And you have to both Sorry, I'm just saying one more thing. When I was doing Shakespeare, um, Oscar Eustis, who directed a production of Julius Caesar, he said, you have to take into consideration when you're doing a piece of theater, a living piece of theater, when it was written, when it's being written about, and when you're performing it. And you have to try to occupy all three of those spaces at the same time. And it's difficult. And sometimes something fits a little bit more or is itchy here um, or feels wrong-headed or even offensive in the current day where it maybe wouldn't have. And um, as artists, as theater artists, we have to be, um, we have to know what we're trying to say. And, um, but we also have to be willing to be wrong. You know, as times change, sometimes things don't age as well. Um, I hope that's true for Book of Mormon. It certainly didn't feel that way while I was, while I was making it. And I'm deeply proud of the family that we um, that we built, yeah. People who are still on a mass text chain every. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. that. Yeah. So um, that was a long-winded way to say. No. 
it's, it, it's constantly evolving. And um, exactly it's life. It's it's not a movie. It, it's happening now, and it was happening then. It's a very, um, yeah. It's it's. Uh, Hard. I think it was beautifully said. It's be, it's very nuanced. It's a lot to navigate, yeah. and so that's why I wanted to I wanted to ask you because I wanted to get go right to the source. Yeah. I have the I have the opportunity to go right to the source. So <laughs> I thought, <laughs> let me just come on right to the source. So that's <laughs> that 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 was that. It's important to hear, and it continues to evolve to yeah. to to evolve. Um, and sort of kind of going off of that, Montego. You know, obviously, I, as I mentioned, there's a running theme. We're amongst <laughs> Tony folks right now. Um, it's a running theme. It's a running theme. Um, but you were nominated for a Tony Award in Best Leading Actress um, for playing Felicia in, um, um, in, in Memphis, the musical. And I, what's so interesting, well, you know, and there's many people thought you should have won. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just saying. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I so what what were the ways you had to navigate in your personal life uh with you know obviously in with this incredible character and sort of mirroring this woman who was of color and in the in in an industry, like it obviously Pearl was the music industry. I mean you are also music acting, all of it, but balancing the act, because you always do it with such poise and grace, but still pushing those barriers. So I I, I want to know, um, you, you really succeed in that in your personal life. So how did you navigate that with playing this character in Memphis that was such a, you know, a, a barrier breaking woman as well? And go. go. <laughs> <laughs> So many easy questions, Michael. <laughs> all right. They're so, big. I want it. I'm like, I want it all. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Um, first, let me say, my approach is, is, is holistic. It is about seeing the whole landscape and the whole picture. The minute I start to get too um, focused on the minutia, then I'm in trouble, which is not to say that I don't concentrate on details. I do not have attention to detail because I very much do. But I think those things have to be uh, uh, coded in for me so that I can properly express to, to my personal universe and my professional universe what is truly authentically me and my worldview. Having said that, it, it just starts like really at, at the at the bottom or at the top and works its way down or the bottom and works its way up. It's grassroots that grows right or it's starting at the bottom and it rains properly. Um, and, you know, with Memphis, we were telling a story that was based on a true story but had not ever been told before on Broadway. How race music, that's what it was called at the time, speaking of things made for a certain times in the 1950s, it's called race music, not, if, not necessarily like R&B. And so introducing that concept, first of all, in the storytelling, but also to Broadway audiences who hadn't necessarily heard it told this way before. So that was, I took that job very seriously. She is not an actual part of that story. So making her, giving her blood and bone and actual roots mm. in that story so that it feels whole in its in its entirety was really important. Um, and I'm very grateful, as Nikki uh, stated before, I'm very grateful to our creatives for making a safe space, making a space where your thoughts and feelings were encouraged and heard fully. And we, because there was such confidence in everyone wanting to be a part of the work, there was never a moment where I felt um, disregarded or under underseen or underheard. It was, and if, a, if an idea I had didn't work, it just didn't work. It had really nothing to do with anything else. And I think that was, that kind of focus on what we're all there to do served me well in that process. And so when it was time to, to tell the story of an African-American experience, it gave me a lot of freedom 
because I wasn't worried that she would be misunderstood. I wasn't worried that I would be misunderstood as I was trying to get her um, across. And so threading that from my personal life onto the stage makes me say to you now, you know, <clears throat> First and foremost, I, I remember my grandfather saying these words to me, and it's so true. Um, pe treat people the way you want to be treated. And um, if everybody says you're a horse, you're probably a horse. So it's really important <laughs> that if you are, um, if I were really trying to get a point across, if I were really trying to appeal to uh, a sense of, um, what's the word, artistry, or a sense of, of, of camaraderie um, in the creative process, that, that came from a space that was true to me. Um, I would never ask a person in the creative process for something that I would not do with them or for them personally. I would mm -hmm. never demand something from someone I would not want myself, and in many cases, be willing to, um, to back up, like to, to, to lack of a better phrase, to, to prove that I earned. It's, I'm not there by mistake. I'm not speaking to you by mistake. These are all very important and very necessary conversations. And I'm here because I believe in your level of consciousness as much as I believe in my own. That has been the thing. Being mindful, mm. being conscious, um, and seeing the whole picture. You said it so well a few segments ago, Michael. It's not a sprint. My life is not a sprint. My career is not a sprint. It is a marathon. It is my dream job. Mm, absolutely, I love that. Thank you. That's beautiful. It's beautifully said, and it's you know because it, it, it does evolve. And but but you are navigating it, and it changes and twists and turns. And when you get get opportunities on a big level, big scale of things, it's important to figure out how you actually sort of step into that role <laughs> to yes. navigate it. So I'm, yes. so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's, it's, it's just so important. Brandon, I kind of want to, I kind of want to, um, I want to ask you just a little, just like a little bit different question in terms of for, for you specifically, because you are not only uh, a successful actor, you are also a successful producer as well. And I think that's a really, um, uh, it's really interesting for me to hear your navigation um, uh, in that. Uh, so obviously in that field, there's a, <laughs> even more or less folks of color um, and on that sort of side of, of it. And I know that, uh, you're naturally a leader. Um, I mean, it's just it, it it's 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 in you, and people who know you think of you in that way, um, in that light. So for me, I am curious: did the producing come out of something specific? Uh, you know, with like a with a experience or anything, you know, within your career, or had it always been on your radar to be doing as well? And what that has, how that has navigated for you, how you've been able to navigate those two worlds. It, I would say it was never, uh, it was never on the radar in the, to begin with. I mean, I was always very focused on like, I'm trying to be the 19 year old sensation on Broadway. And so you were. You know, it, kept, it took a while. Were you not 19? No, I mean, but, but I couldn't call myself a sensation singing the Trump song. I just couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, you know, for me, it, get, it becomes that, that natural progression of, you know, you're trying to gain command over your, your lines and your notes, mm -hmm. and then you're trying to gain command over the scene itself, and then the, the, the act and the show. It's like, it, it, as we grow as artists, it's like, all right, well, you, you start to gain a greater understanding of the levels upon which you can exert your influence on the storytelling as a whole. And so, you know, the, the more, the more and more, I wanted to participate in the creative process, the more suggestions I had. And partly, part of it is because I was able to, I was able to create a couple of shows early on in my career. And I was with creative teams who were very welcoming. Um, they, they very much incorporated their actors into a, a collaboration. And so I was used to contributing to shows in that way. Um, and so I began to think more and more about how to, you know, the control I could have over a show. Um, but also thinking about the financial elements that are involved. You know, you you work on a show, 
and then you you you're you you're on stage for you know like a year or two and and then you're gone but a lot of your creative material remains with that show and these things will last 20 30 years they, they have different different iterations and it was really the working on Motown the musical that solidified the decision to form a production company you know we went through a a, a winding developmental process on that and i eventually got them, convinced them to hire our choreographer, uh, Warren Adams, who teamed up with Patty Wilcox. But I've been trying to get them to hire Warren for like a year. <laughs> um, and, you know, and that was because as fully integrated into the creative process as I was early on, I recognized that as we got into really doing the production, I wouldn't be able to be in all those production meetings and all those interior conversations. And I wanted, I wanted somebody in there who could let me know exactly what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> I recognize that Warren is a kind of artist and in kind of intellect who he could do all the work. Warren will choreograph the thing on on the fly. Like he'll choreograph it, but what he will do is he will make sure that everybody adheres to their integrity of the show the best to the best way possible. Well, and, and real quick, it should be said that you just so we all are clear, because I I forgot to even list this another credit that was happening. <laughs> but Brandon Victor Dixon <laughs> played uh, Mr. Barry Gordy in Motown Musical. So I'm just thank you. There we go. <laughs> With Miss Felicia, uh, you know, tell the nominee. But I just wanted to make sure we said that as well, so people knew what was going on. On okay. um, the the musical, but and then Warren Adams came and became the what, the co choreographer. He won the Astaire Award, but you know I also knew that Warren would Warren would elevate the the creative intellect of everybody on the team. And it, him and I kind of you know talking to each other. I like all right, all right. I'm gonna see BG tonight at eleven. Okay, so when you talk to Barry, don't give him that note. Give him this note, and then I'll, I'll just I'll write it all for him tonight, and then we can. And don't worry, I, we'll deal with Kevin and Charles tomorrow. Because we'll, we'll figure out. So it was a lot of that. And, then, and by the end, Warren and I were like, "We're producers. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's just do this." <laughs> Amazing. So wow. So it really. So yes. Yeah. So and about and also, I will say, you're right. You know, because I was doing a show about Barry Gordy. I did a show about Ray Charles. I did a piece about Sam Cooke. I did it. All of these individuals were the first uh, artists to own their masters, to own their publishing, to own their own record labels. So, so they were about independent economic and political empowerment for black people and black communities. They were also about recognizing that the path to growth was by investing in the black youth. That's all Barry Gordy did. All of our favorite artists are from Detroit. <laughs> it's Detroit. <laughs> right. The youth of your black community and the whole world transformed. It did. Absolutely. It did. I, well, I love that. I mean, that's that's so wonderful. And that to me, I, I'm just, in, I, I really am, you know, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, some people don't have the, um, you know, the, 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 the guts to do that, or they don't feel the empowerment to move forward with that sort of thing when it's maybe blaring in your face, as my mom says, don't block your blessing. You know, <laughs> just sort of like this idea of, you know, you actually moving to another side of things and uh, being a part of the, cre the like the you know the actual control of it as well so i was I i'm curious about that because there's obviously a lot of navigating that you have to do as we've all had to well, michael yeah. Park was also a recognition that at that point considering my age our age we had been able to walk into certain rooms that a lot of our colleagues hadn't been able to yes but yeah. yes but i know uh, you know a daniel watts like I know, like I know these extraordinary creatives. I, I know an, uh, an Amber Mon. It's like so. If we are in these rooms, maybe it's a little premature, but if we're here, we can work to create space for our fellow artists. That's why it's called Walk, Run, Fly. You know, <laughs> you create a platform for all of us as developing artists to walk, to run, so that our work can fly. You know, and that's part of that marathon uh, uh, that we've been talking about, right? Like it's not just our marathon. Like at some point, someone passed a baton, whether we yeah. knew it or not. Someone yeah. passed the baton, they leave the door open and then you bust through that door and then you get to the next one and you leave it open. And, um, and, it, and it's, that is like a, it's part of what you're saying about lifting up uh, the community. It's not about us getting far. It's about who's going to be beside us and behind us when we get where we're going. Exactly. 
I know exactly. that it's hard to remember who the second person through a certain door is, but that person is actually more important than the first. And like we, our generation, like I've known every single person on this panel for about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, we are, we are an older generation at this point. Like yeah. we have been in this business and, um, and I want to be, I don't want to be up out here by myself. And I've been floored by the talent, the, the, the intelligence, the grace, the strength of some of the, the young black artists and other artists of color who have come uh, in the last like 10 years on Broadway and, in, and not just on Broadway. That's, that's the other thing. Like, let's also like give a huge shout out to the incredible work that's being done off Broadway in regional theaters. Yes. Mm -hmm all across this country. Of Ooh. course, we are this this monolith, you know, we have this name, but like that is not to say that that other work is not like vitally important. Um, Absolutely, and that's exactly. We all started there to make it here, you know, and we're gonna yeah. make our way back. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so we are, so I have I have one, one more question for the three of you and um, it, it, this sort of, this is the great. I mean, we again. We are literally just. I feel like we're just getting started, and, and especially with this conversation. I mean, we could talk more, more and more and more. Um, but it was. It's. It's really important for me to be able to hear for, for folks to be able to hear from from beautiful people like yourselves because uh, it, it should. It there is a, there are other voices in terms of. Um, the way you go about things, like it's a, there's no, there's a whole array of how we we go about things, and not everything is a specific way. I mean, we're we're as Montego said, the grassroots of you know things are sprouting, and and as you all were doing, y'all are being inspired by other folks, and and vice versa. So it's so wonderful to to hear that. It's really important for me to make sure that people hear those um, those views. So my question for you all is. How has your views on navigating, right, changed during this specific racial awakening? Um, not only in obviously in this, this country, but even more specifically um, in our Broadway, uh, you know, in our, in our entertainment industry. What has changed for you all? And I'll let Montego, Montego, why don't you go? <laughs> well, I think there is a part of it that I don't even know yet. I don't. I don't know exactly how much, um, what what percentage of my holistic view or my whole landscape view is going to uh, need a full readjustment because some of it is done on your feet. Some of it happens that first day of rehearsal or when you read that script for the first time or when you start to have those talks. And I'm fully prepared for that. So that's one. The other though is being aware that there's going to be um there going to be there's going to be an uncomfortable and I mean it in a good way we're going to re-enter with an uncomfortable feeling around us an uncomfortable space and it is okay to be there it's not something to be run away from so my sense of navigating will be it will be probably possibly comfortable for me as much as it's uncomfortable for the next person and we are okay as long as we are reaching across and holding each other everything is going to be all right. Cause I'm not going to let you go and you're not going to let me go. Um, I think that's really important is that it doesn't feel like I'm here and I'm spiraling. Blah, blah, blah. It, it must be a, a, a point of view and a vantage point that allows everyone to be in the room because we all have to have the conversations together. Um, mm. And yeah. I, and other than that, it's just for my personal um, movements, what continues to work and if you have to go back through the list, Montego, what is not working? Is there anything that isn't working, that isn't properly aligned with you, that isn't properly aligned with what you know needs to happen? Because if it isn't, get very, very still, get very, very quiet with yourself and have the conversation internally so that you can really actually have it outside of your own artist heart, outside of your own spirit. There's just no way to enter into a proper dialogue and proper action now, if I haven't gone back to my own drawing board and really checked on all the levers and the gauges. Lovely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Nikki, how about for you? What is, what is, what is, what is, how has your views changed right now in this moment, um, sort of navigating 
within this racial um, awakening? Uh, well, I think the first thing I'll say, which is like, um, I've always been um, civically minded and up on the news. And I, I think that um, I want to, I want to believe that the thing that will change was that I will stop having a separation between my career life and also what's happening, um, what what steps I need to take in order for the world that I live in to be the world that I want to reflect um, in my art. I think that like we can't have um, theater, a Broadway community, a theater community that doesn't have racism and uh, bigotry and you know microaggressions if we don't live in a society that um, isn't free of racism and microaggressions and and bigotry, um, we are a part of a of a bigger community. I, I also think that I what I would want for myself is to spend a little less time trying to guess what people want from me. Uh, not to say that I've been inauthentic. Ever. Say that again. Say that again. I, I think I would like to spend a little less time <laughs> trying <laughs> to figure out what people want from me. In, mm -hmm. in this world where we're auditioning a lot and some part of that is about guessing, like me, like me, is this thing that I have to offer the thing that they want? Is this thing that I have to offer the thing that they want? And I think I just wanted to be more like, screw it. This is what I have to offer. And, and I'm not going to try to qualify that. I'm not going to decide it's to this or to that. Either someone is going to take in what I have to bring to the table or they're not. And if they're not, I'm not going to spend my energy there. I, I can't send my cosmic energy there because it's depleting and it, it weakens me for the other fights. The other mm. fights that are bigger than what part I get. Um, and what job I have. I, I'm so lucky. I'm in this room with posters of all these shows that I've worked on with incredible human beings. And um, I do think that there's a part of me that wants to uh, find a little bit more space for whoever I am. What, what kind of actress, what kind of person, um, what kind of spirit I am. And I, I think I do that. Yeah. I want to do that more. I will say, I think you do that. I think you do that. So, I mean, I mean, I think all of you do that, which is, you know, in your ways for yeah. sure. And I've been um, involved in accidental activism theater a lot. Um, <laughs> where I was like, I did this production of Julius Caesar in the park a couple of summers ago where we were doing this sort of like commentary on Trumpism and like sort of like the, the, the fragility of democracy um, that was protested by people. And I did this Tony Kushner play about the end of the Weimar Republic in Germany. So I've been doing all this like accidental, you know, <laughs> with theater. And, um, uh, um, and so I think maybe that's something that's awakening me that I haven't really taken up. I haven't really opened up my heart to. So <laughs> me in a year, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. We'll, we'll do a reunion special. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, and then for you, what is that? What is, has, what, how has the navigating changed for you right now because it's a it's a lot <laughs> there's a lot going on so for you what has that been like i don't know that the navigating has changed uh, but i will say you know uh, 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 there's there's a different level of awareness for me look i america is a racist country and therefore you know all the environments and institutions within it are tainted with that in some way shape or form and so broadway possesses elements of that systemically as well um but I, but I, I will say, you know, I recognize that I have probably had a very exceptional life in theater. You know, I, I have, I have been offered the opportunities. You know, I, I tend to, my, my, my work to reward ratio tends to exist at like one and a half to one, one to one. I have not experienced any of the microaggressions or some of the overt aggressions, racial aggressions that a number of my colleagues have that I've been hearing about lately. And I've also. I've also been fortunate enough to be a part of very diverse shows with even also with diverse creative teams. Um, and so listening, really listening to uh, a lot of the things that I'm hearing, obviously, again, I recognize them because, you know, the, I, I understand systemic racism and, and, and how these things play their part. But, um, but I'm, I'm looking at our, our industry and, and, and things a little bit differently. And I'm recognizing also that even though I haven't directly 
um, encounter a lot of these things. And on every show I've done, my fellow cast members, whether they were younger or older than me, would regularly come to me to ask me if I would talk to stage management about this or company. <laughs> <laughs> significant, you know, like why are we a direct deposit? But some <laughs> things that I'm like, I don't know why this is. Why am I the one to come to you all to talk to you about? So I'm recognizing it's one they didn't want to do those things because they received the microaggressions and the change of treatment, and I have, and I was able to do it because I was seen. And yeah. I, yes. I'm fortunate enough that I've always been able to be seen in the business. And I said this, I was on a call with. Like, you know, uh, Audra and LaChance and Felicia and Stokes and a lot of, you know, and I had to say to them, you know, uh, as much as I've been going through this in, a, in, a, in this period in a different way, I wanted to say, you know, I, I need to say a very tangible thank you to you. Because I recognize that the exceptional nature of my path is largely due to the fact that you all barreled into these rooms. And I know your path was not as smooth as mine. Right. And it's because you came in and you cleared space and you also came in in a certain way. And I came in the way you came in. <laughs> I, I, engage with people I hear you. I hear you. I, 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 th that's I, important. I, that is, I love I, that. And I, and I, there's a it? way to open people up. And I, clearly I've, I've done that and people have received me in that way. And, and I'm grateful that they gave me that legacy, that they gave me that path. It was a very clear path. Um, and, yeah. and, and so, you know, so for me, it's, 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 it's had me thinking even just trying to be even more conscious about the, even just the, 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 the lower level things that are constant and that pile up for so many of my colleagues. It's just like, yeah, that, that's the thing for me to start thinking more consciously about that and how to unpack those things before they can get there. Yeah. I love that. I mean, that, I mean, that's a, a, a beautiful way to sort of wrap up today because I think all three of you have, entered in that way that you're just that you just that you've talked about and and and, and to me there is a uh, the word grace comes in into it because there is it, it, it's not only grace but it also says while i am doing this just so you know <laughs> i see you <laughs> as well but it is also in a graceful way and i think that that's really really important in this time and also uh brandon i'm so happy to acknowledge that because that is exactly why we you know like you said giving space for us to be able to do that and that is a beautiful thing that as as montego said earlier with the sort of grassroots and sort of growing and how that 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 goes that it allows us to, to be able to actually have the conversation and and be heard that there's a there's a listening thing going on. So, thank you for saying that. Um, and obviously, it's very obvious the three of you have <laughs> have done that in your careers. Um, I am so thankful that you all opened your um, your hearts, your amazing minds, and just sort of the way the, how you speak for um, our Broadway.com audience to hear your perspectives and your knowledge uh, on navigating such beautiful careers. Um, again, it's only, this is a marathon. So, you know, you all are still doing it. <laughs> you know, you're still oh, in I quit. I quit. <laughs> <Here's> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> but I am very, very, very thankful for you, Nikki and James, for you, Miss Montego Glover, and for you, Mr. Brandon Victor Dixon. Thank you all for sharing with us, being open and giving us, um, just just giving us beautiful words. Thank you, thank you. My pleasure. Right, happy to be here. Thanks, guys. Lovely. Thank, you. thank you all. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is everything. Um, so that gosh, that is that's that's the end of today. Thank you for tuning in and listening to our discussion. Um, it, it's just so wonderful to be able to have people who are open their hearts like that. And I hope that uh, you could hear it and listen and learn some things from some really pretty um, spectacular folks. Hello, Miss Caitlin. I see that you have come back on in here. <laughs> I just, I learned so much. I'm so thankful for our guests and for you, Michael, for leading such great vulnerable conversations and educating so many Broadway fans about how to be better allies, how to take action in this time. So, so yes. appreciative for you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to head out. Miss Caitlin, you give us, you take us out. <laughs> Bye, girl. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you guys so much for tuning in for this really special fun episode of Live at Five. Uh, you guys can follow us wherever you get your podcast by searching for hashtag Live at Five and hitting that subscribe button. Be sure to tune in tomorrow. We talk to six queen, Samantha Polly. Stay safe and have a great night.